stop thinking the mitochondria is just nerdy stuff that doesn't apply to you because it's just boring biochem. No, it applies to you infinitely. It's everything. Whether you want energy, whether you're after fat loss, whether you're after better workouts, if you focus on the mitochondria, trust me, your life can be better and you will feel just healthier. So today's video is about what you can add to your diet or what you can add via supplementation to have a more well-rounded mitochondria. So it's five ingredients that boost mitochondrial function. And by the end of this video, you will have a clear understanding. So I'll break down with analogies how this actually works and why it's so important. So first, let me just dive right into an analogy. Your mitochondria is where you create energy, right? It's where you create ATP. So it's essentially the motor of your car. Now, the motor of your car doesn't just create energy because you put gasoline in your car. Okay, there's a lot of other moving pieces, right? There's oil, there's coolant, there's a spark. There's all these different things that create energy. It's not just like you magically put gas in your car and your motor just turns gas into movement. There's so many moving pieces. It's the same thing with mitochondria. We don't just magically take energy from food and just voila, we have energy. No, there's a lot of moving pieces. So there's three things that we'll focus on in this video. And by enhancing these three things, we have ultimately better mitochondria, at least from a scientific perspective based on the research I've seen, right? The first thing we wanna do is we wanna be able to create more energy. We wanna be able to create more ATP. We is, in essence, we want to have a stronger motor, a more powerful motor, okay? Then the second thing we need to focus on with these ingredients is reducing the metabolic stressors, reducing the waste that could be slowing down the motor, the sludge, clogging of the fuel lines, inefficiency. And then thirdly, what we wanna focus on with our, well, cellular motor, is we wanna focus on mitochondrial biogenesis. We wanna focus on, well, how do we make our mitochondria stronger and how do we ultimately create more motors, or in this case, more horsepower, right? New mitochondria. So anyhow, the mitochondria is just fascinating stuff and it's so powerful, it has its own DNA. So anyway, let's just go ahead and let's jump into the ingredients that you need to know. I do ask that you please hit that red subscribe button if you don't mind, and then also check that little, or click on the little bell icon and select all notifications. That's gonna allow you to receive the daily videos that we are putting out there. So please, 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 I really appreciate it. And then after this video, I highly recommend you check out Juve. If you're interested in red light therapy, speaking of mitochondria, it's a pretty interesting thing. It's kind of like infrared, except not. It's actually direct red light therapy. I've done full videos on it, but they're a huge sponsor, a huge supporter of this channel, and I wanna give them a big thank you for supporting us during these trying times, and I encourage you to check them out. The best way you can support this channel is by supporting our awesome sponsor. So thank you, Juve. Check them out down below. Okay, first thing we need to talk about, carnitine. Carnitine is different than what people think. We see carnitine um, marketed as like this fat loss thing, right? Sure, there is some of that, but the reality is what it's doing is more of just a metabolic uh, kind of cleanup. Okay, so first off, carnitine is involved in transporting fatty acids across the inner membrane of our mitochondria. So what this means is it takes fat and it brings it into the mitochondria so it ultimately can get utilized. Now, additional carnitine probably isn't going to help us with delivering more fat unless we are deficient in it to begin with. So moreover, what I am interested in is carnitine's ability to remove accumulated toxic acetyl coenzyme A. So what that means is acetyl coenzyme A is uh, what you're ultimately using to create energy. And in time, you end up developing toxic amounts of it because you're building up energy, right? You're using energy and you have a byproduct. It turns out that carnitine can help balance that. It cleans up some of that metabolic waste. But another thing that it does is it suppresses what is called fatty acid-induced mitochondrial membrane damage. So let me explain what this looks like in an analogy, okay? Your motor creates energy. Well, eventually, the block where your actual motor is is going to wear down. It's going to come deformed, right? Well, you need some repair there. You need that, that wall or that membrane that's damaged to be repaired. Well, it turns out that carnitine can help assist with that. Now, fatty acids, whenever we're burning fatty acids for fuel, like we are in ketosis or beta oxidation or fasting or anything like that, we are incurring a good amount of mitochondrial membrane damage. So it turns out that carnitine helps repair some of that damage. So it, in essence, is making your mitochondria cleaner. At the same time, it's also helping more fuel come in. Now, just for the record, that was published in Drug Discovery Today. So that's not just my words. That's like some good words coming out of some good published research. 
But there was an additional study that was published in obesity reviews. And this is good for those of you that are looking at carnitine from a fat loss perspective. They did find that on average, people that consumed a carnitine supplement did lose 2.9 pounds more than those that did not. So yeah, you could argue that maybe carnitine is helping out more fat getting into the cell. But my argument, or at least my hypothesis is that the metabolism is just working more efficiently, the cell is working more efficiently, and someone is getting more active. So there's just different chain reactions that could be causing that, more so than just the direct utilization of carnitine as a supplement. The next thing we have to talk about is going to be the glutathione piece, okay? Getting a good amount of protein in, plain and simple. Okay, so if you're consuming protein from fatty fish, from a little bit of liver, things like that, you should be getting a good amount of glutathione coming in. Now, here's the thing. Glutathione is our body's inherent uh, antioxidants, our natural ability to kind of detox. Well, we have glutathione that lives in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is such an energy powerhouse, it has its own set of antioxidants that live within it because it creates so much energy. What we have to remember is most of the reactive oxygen species, most of the oxidative stress that is created in our body is created in our mitochondria. Again, think of your car. Most of the waste is created by the motor. You might have a little bit that's created by just like the rubber hitting the road and little rubber particles. You might have a little bit here and there. You might have some fumes when you fuel up, but most of the actual exhaust and most of the actual stress that's going out there is a result of the motor. It's the same thing with your mitochondria and the electron transport chain. So without glutathione to do the job, the mitochondria suffers. There have been really good research papers that have come out that have shown that reduced levels of mitochondrial glutathione are linked to damage in the mitochondrial environment, which indicates that, yeah, when we don't have that ability to detox or clean up at the mitochondrial level, it runs amok within the motor, okay? So it's like suddenly we don't have oil in our motor and everything seizes up, plain and simple. But let's have some fun and let's look at a mouse study because we all like mice. Okay, there's a study that was published in Innovation Research. Took a look at 32 mice over the course of 65 weeks. Okay, they put them on either a standard diet or an NAC supplement, so N-acetylcysteine. So basically a precursor to glutathione. Well, turns out that those that ended up taking the N-acetylcysteine supplement ended up having a lifespan that was about 23.7% longer. Okay, that's pretty fascinating. That shows us right then and there, at least demonstrates, that there is a big role when it comes down to just energy metabolism. The mitochondria is important for healthy aging. If we have inefficient mitochondria, we don't age efficiently. That's kind of the root of it all, to be completely honest. All right, now let's jump into another thing that we need to be paying attention to, some specific B vitamins. Now it frustrates me because I feel like B vitamins just get swept under the rug all the time. They're just, they're not that important to people. Oh, oh, it's rich in B vitamins. You see it on everything. And quite honestly, it's probably just over marketed. The reality is, if you are focusing on doing a low carb diet or you're focusing on fasting or you're metabolically just a very active person, okay, you're running a lot, you're, act you're going to probably deplete a lot of B vitamins, okay? So here's the thing. B vitamins are required in a lot more of the intermediary processes and enzymatic uh, functions that come into play with the mitochondria. Uh, B1, for example, plays a huge role in the formulation of ketoacid dehydrogenase formation. Okay, this is something that carries the energy from food to the electron transport chain. So let me explain to it like this, all right? You've got um, food that you just ate. Well, you've got nutrition, you've got energy in the food, but it doesn't just magically leach out of the food and go to the mitochondria. No, it needs, it needs someone to take it. So it takes it, pulls it out, pulls the energy out, and puts it on another bus. It's like the airporter, right? You, you, you call an airporter, you call an Uber to get you to the airport, and then the plane takes you to where you really wanna go. Okay, food comes in, this keto acid dehydrogenase comes in and it grabs the food, it grabs the nutrients out of the food, and it takes them to the plane. And then the plane takes them to the mitochondria. We need vitamin B1 for this. We absolutely need it, it's imperative. Then we have B5, pantothenic acid. This is an intermediary, okay? So coenzyme A formation. Again, we need that to ultimately create energy. Take my word for it, it's very important. And then lastly, we have niacin, vitamin B3. I don't necessarily think you need to supplement additional niacin. One of the things that I like to do is just consume uh, nutritional yeast because it's high in a lot of different B vitamins. But what this does is it creates NAD+. Okay, NAD is the actual airplane that's going to carry the nutrients or carry the energy down the electron transport chain. So you have the mitochondria, 
mitochondria creates energy, but the energy has to get there first. And the energy gets there via the electron transport chain. And that electron transport chain is a chain of a lot of different moving pieces that are delivering energy there. NAD plus is delivering the energy to the mitochondria to actually do its job. The next one is one that you've probably seen at Costco. You've probably seen just different stores and it's probably marketed all wrong to be completely honest. It's coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10's job is to enhance ATP production. Okay, it is there to help you create more energy from high energy electrons. Okay, now additionally, it helps protect you, uh, so that protects the mitochondria so you can actually have that mitochondrial biogenesis. You can actually create more healthy mitochondria. So coenzyme Q10 is like, well, it's kind of like the movie Con Air. Okay, I want you to think of this. You've got these high energy electrons, high potency, powerful, dangerous people, okay? Well, they're on a plane and they're going somewhere to get put to work. Well, if that plane goes down, you have a big problem. Or if those uh, convicts escape the plane, you have a big problem, right? You've got dangerous criminals out there on the loose. Well, these high energy electrons that coenzyme Q10 carries are just that way. They're potent. They need to get delivered to the mitochondria. They need to get where they're supposed to go so they can get turned into actual ATP, actual energy for you to use. But if it's weak, then those high energy electrons don't have that coenzyme Q10, they're going to leak out of the electron transport chain and go out into the world and just cause a bunch of damage, free radical damage, okay? We want those convicts to get where they're going. We do not want them escaping, okay? So that's the best way to describe coenzyme Q10. It carries high energy electrons. But here's a fun fact. If you wanna combine coenzyme Q10 with something, combine it with a little bit of alpha lipoic acid. Now this gets into some nerdy stuff with epigenetics. Epigenetics is sort of the uh, progressive changing of our genetics based on just different factors, right? So alpha lipoic acid has been seen in some cases to have an epigenetic effect on genes that are associated with inflammation. Now I'm very careful to talk about inflammation, right? I don't wanna say the wrong thing with inflammation because you know, obviously different people, different situations. But it's just interesting to see that we could potentially be making some changes metabolically that affect the genes that would trigger inflammation and maybe start getting ourselves down a road of being able to combat chronic inflammation down the road. So that's just kind of a fun fact. So combining coenzyme Q10 with alpha lipoic acid might be a really powerful way to just feel better. I'm super glad you haven't clicked off the video yet because this last one is probably one of the most important and one of the most overlooked. It's magnesium. Magnesium is required to create ATP, and it's required to create it efficiently. But I have some interesting stuff to show you here. There's a 2001 study that was published by DeMeo that took a look at uh, intense training sessions. And it was found that when subjects would go through any kind of intense training, mainly aerobic in this case, they would trigger a lot of oxidative stress. It would induce oxidative stress. Well, it makes sense, right? But then that oxidative stress would subsequently induce some mitochondrial damage. So basically when we're working out, we're causing some level of mitochondrial damage. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it's pretty short lived and our bodies go through a natural self repair process. Everything with working out is an adaptive response. We're trying to get stronger. So we work out, sure, we damage our mitochondria, but then it self repairs and it gets stronger and we become better athletes. So over the short term it repairs, but over the long term it can actually allow us to get a larger uh, matrix, so create more energy, but also develop more mitochondrial density, which means a stronger, more efficient mitochondria. However, magnesium is a cofactor for this self repair. Without magnesium, this doesn't happen, or at least doesn't happen as efficiently. So magnesium becomes very, very important, especially after a workout, so you can supply yourself with what you need in the way of magnesium to be a proper cofactor for this self repair mechanism of the mitochondria. It's been demonstrated in a few studies that lower levels of magnesium are linked with oxidative capacity declining, meaning the basically the cell's ability to process energy from oxygen goes down if magnesium levels are low. Well, probably has a lot to do with just, again, not being able to repair properly and get stronger. But if we want to take it a little bit further, there's a 2016 study that was authored by Yamanaka, really interesting stuff that took a look at magnesium transporters on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, so magnesium two transporters. And they took a look at knockout mice that didn't have the ability to take magnesium into the mitochondria. And they noticed that there was a huge disruption in energy metabolism. So they took a look at it directly with knockout mice. So what that means is they have mice that didn't have the ability to process magnesium. Okay, they're called knockout. They can't do this in humans, but they can do it in mice, right? So I know you might poo-poo a mouse study, but it makes sense. So when you take that ability away, 
the mice, they, their mitochondria just weren't functioning. They weren't able to create energy nearly as well. So it imitates a little bit of what it would look like if we didn't have my, uh, magnesium or if our magnesium levels were low. A lot of people ask when to take magnesium, things like that. I usually recommend taking magnesium, um, you know, usually in the evening time, but if you're working out exceptionally hard, especially with aerobic activity, it might not be a bad idea to take magnesium post-workout. This is relatively new science to me at least. So interesting stuff. So just to recap here, carnitine, probably in the ballpark of like a thousand milligrams or so like that. I'm not a doctor and remember, different situations for different people, okay? So carnitine, okay? Then we wanna focus on just getting adequate amounts of protein, preferably from fatty fish and from liver and stuff like that. Or if you're up for it, take a glutathione supplement, but again, you do you, okay? Then B vitamins, nutritional yeast, eating things like that, focusing on B1, B3, and B5 vitamins. Coenzyme Q10, usually recommend doing that in a supplemental form, again, you can do whatever it feels good for you. Personally, I take between three and 600 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 per day. I don't really take a whole lot of alpha lipoic acid, but I did mention that within the video. Then additionally, you want to be focusing on getting magnesium in. I usually recommend between four and 500 milligrams per day, maybe split it up between post-workout and before bed so you can get the relaxation effect and maybe sleep a little bit better. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow.